السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته. اللهم أكبر الله أكبر الله أكبر الله الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور انفسنا ومن سيئات اعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له واشهد ان لا اله الا الله وحده لا شريك له واشهد ان محمدا عبد الله ورسوله صلى الله تعالى عليه وعلى اله وصحبه وسلم تسليما كثيرا اما بعد فإن أصدق الحديث كتاب الله عز وجل وخير الهدي هدي رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم وشر الأمور محدثاتها وكل محدثة بدعة وكل بدعة ضلالة وكل ضلالة في النار أما بعد فيقول الإمام البخاري رحمه الله تعالى في كتابه الجامع الصحيح حدثنا عبد الله بن يوسف قال أخبرنا مالك بن أنس عن ابن شهاب الزهري عن ابن عبد الله عن ابيه رضي الله تعالى عنهما ان رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم مر على رجل من الانصار وهو يعظ اخاه في الحياء فقال دعه فان الحياء من الايمان او بهذا المعنى والحديث رواه الامام مسلم the speech that i want to share with you the topic of my sermon the discussion at hand, the lecture at hand, today's khutbah will be on a story, a brief story, a simple story. Not too long, not too dramatic, nothing too epic. One day the Messenger of Allah والسلام, passed by some men, some companions, and these companions were from the Ansar. They were from the indigenous inhabitants of Medina, i.e. they didn't leave Mecca. They didn't come from Yemen. They didn't come from other parts of Arabia or North Africa or the world to make hijrah. 
but they were actually homegrown people of Medina. The people who met the Messenger of Allah وسلم, in secrecy years before he reached Medina. They made Hajj. Hajj was known for a very long time. The Kaaba, the pilgrimage, even among the Mushrikun, even among the people of Shirk, from the things that remained from the way of Ismail and Ibrahim. It was known. And it was a time of meeting, a time of association, a time in which you could fraternize and learn about different Arab tribes and clans. So the people of Medina went to Mecca, the Syrians, etc. So these people here, they went to Mecca from Medina and they met the Prophet ﷺ in secrecy. And they told him, they professed to him that they believed in him and that they were willing to die to protect him and for the cause of Al-Islam. And they gave him a guarantee and a promise is that if and when you leave Mecca and you come to Medina, we will be here for you already waiting. We will protect you, we will serve you, we will keep you safe like we are to keep our own family safe, the Ansar. The Ansar, the difference between the Ansar and the Muhajireen. They never left their homes. The Ansar were the indigenous inhabitants of Medina. And obviously the Prophet wasallam, when he came to Medina, he found many new things, many new problems that did not exist in Mecca. But that's not the topic of the discussion. What's important is, is that these men were from the Ansar. They were Ansari men. And as if the Messenger of Allah wasallam, overheard their conversation, as if one of these two men was raising his voice, was becoming mad and angry and upset or emotional. As if one of them was speaking to his brother, that put the Messenger of Allah in a state of interest. مَرَّ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ صَلَى اللَّهِ وَسَلَّمَ عَلَىٰ رَجُلٍ مِنَ الْأَنصَارِ وَهُوَ يَعِذُ أَخَاهُ فِي الْحَيَاةِ And he was raising his voice, he was speaking to his brother, and he was telling his brother about something that he shouldn't be doing. Something that he should get rid of a characteristic, a trait, a habit, a practice that isn't good in that man's eyesight. And that was what? Fil Hayat. His brother, whether it was his blood brother, or brother of tribe and clan, the Aus, the Khazraj, he was very shy. He was very meek. He was very modest. He was very soft-spoken. He was a humble, mellow fellow. He was a shy man. And the Ansari man, he says, stop being shy. Get rid of your shyness. Man up. Toughen up. You're too soft. Like we would say, right? A father says to his son, speak up, son. A mother says to her daughter, don't be shy. And unfortunately, in public, in the supermarket or a superstore, Walmart or Target, you go somewhere and a stranger speaks to a young child, a boy or a girl, and the young child is shy. The young child goes behind the uh, aisle or the products and the mother says oh don't be shy it's okay speak speak to this stranger it's all right don't be shy don't have shyness this is what we say in our culture correct you meet a long lost family member an uncle or not someone that you haven't met before you're shy you don't know this person and the first thing that we tell our children is what don't be shy don't be shy son so the man he told his companion or he told his friend he says don't be so shy you're too shy you're a man you're weak you're soft the Prophet ﷺ, upon hearing this, he said, Da'hu, leave him alone. Leave him be. Stop harassing him. Stop harrying him. Stop bothering him. Why? Shouldn't a man be rough and tough? Should a man be shy? Is it a good thing to be an adult and to be shy and to be afraid and meek and soft spoken? Shouldn't you be loud and about and confident and overbearing as a man? The Prophet ﷺ, he explained why the man should leave him alone. فَإِنَّ الْحَيَاءَ مِنَ الْإِيمَانِ And that's because shyness, modesty, bashfulness is a part of faith. Da'hu, leave him be. Stop talking to him. Stop speaking to him. Because shyness is a part of being a Muslim. Shyness is a part of being a believer. Shyness is one of the greatest traits and one of the greatest characteristics of one who submits his will to Allah. قال العلامة الحافظ شيخ الإسلام الثاني ابن قيم من الجوزي رحمه الله تعالى الحياء من أفضل الأخلاق وأجلها وأعظمها قدرا وأكثرها نفعا بل هو خاصة الإنسانية فمن لا حياء فيه 
فليس معه من الإنسانية إلا اللحم والدم والصورة الظاهرة Ibn Qayyim rahimahullah Allah, he said that shyness is one of the best types of behavior to have. One of the greatest types of characteristic to have as a, a person is to be shy. Afdal al-akhlaq wa ajalliha. The most sublime, the most noble, the greatest thing to have is to be shy. And it is a mode of behavior, it is a character trait, it is a way of conducting and holding yourself which is extremely beneficial. وَأَكْثَرِهَا نَفْعًا It helps you, it helps others, those whom you're around, you come in contact with, everyone benefits from the one who is shy. He says, the one who has no shyness, he never knows when to stop, when to be quiet. He doesn't know how to say no or yes because of shyness. He doesn't know how to walk away. He doesn't know how to turn away. He doesn't know how to feel bad and how to feel shy. He doesn't know how to be modest and bashful then he has no humanity in him whatsoever. He says, shyness khasatul insaniya. That is the stark trait of the human being that separates man from the animal, man from the insect, man from the bird, man from the creature. A civilized, cultured man from an uncouth savage. A shyness and bashfulness. So he who has no shyness, he who does not know how to be shy, he who has no modesty whatsoever has no humanity with him, period. Except for flesh, blood, bones, skin, etc. Outwardly. So this person has no shyness in actuality as if he's not even a human being. Just like he has no good with him whatsoever. How can this be? I'm never shy. I'm not a human being. How can shyness be so important in Islam that the Prophet ﷺ told the man to leave him be, to leave him alone? Why is shyness so special? And what does the Quran and Sunnah talk about shyness? What does Allah say about being shy and being modest and being bashful? What does the Prophet ﷺ tell us about being shy and modest and bashful, being ashamed? What is the purpose and the benefit behind this, brothers and sisters? Do we need to be shy or should we be courageous and bold and outspoken? أَقُولُ مَا سَمِتُمْ وَاسْتَغْفِرُ اللَّهَ تَعَالَى لِي وَلَكُمْ فَاسْتَغْفِرُهُ إِنَّهُ هُوَ الْغَفُورُ الرَّحِيمُ الحمد لله وكفاء وصلاة الله وسلامه على عباده الذين اصطفى أما بعد The Messenger of Allah عليه الصلاة والسلام has spoke on shyness and so many authentic ahadith from them as that which Imran ibn Hussein radiallahu ta'ala anhu has narrated in the Sahihain in al hayaa la ya'ti illa bi khayrin shyness never brings anything except good shyness whenever there is shyness there there is good there similar to what the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa said about gentleness in Allah rafiqun yuhibbu rifqa wa yu'ti alayhi ma la yu'ti ala al unf Allah is gentle and Allah loves gentleness. And Allah allows things to take place through gentleness that He does not allow to take place through harshness and violence. The Messenger of Allah والسلام, said to his wife, his friend, his companion, and his student and pupil, Laysa hakada ya bint al Siddiq, O daughter of Abu Bakr, no, 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 no. Assalamu alaikum wallana. May poison be given to you, may Allah curse you. She was impulsive to those people who use that sly statement, Assalamu alaikum, which is very similar to Assalamu alaikum, which means death be upon you, O Muhammad. We don't believe in you. We have our own books, we have our own scriptures, we have our own prophets, we have our own messengers. You Arabs are backwards. We are civilized people. We've had the lineage of prophets and messengers for generations. You're idol worshiping Arabs. We don't believe in you. Even though we know you're a true prophet. Even though we know that you speak the same way that Moses spoke. We know this. This is clear. It is in our book. It is well known that your message is the message of Musa. However, we will not believe in you because of your blood and your lineage. You come from Ishmael. And we will not accept you because you did not come from Ishaq. So the Jews of Medina, they said things to the Prophet Wasallam. And from that which they said to him was, Assalamu alaikum. They played a game, a trick with the words. 
They removed the letter. May death be on you. And the Prophet وسلم, obviously he heard what they said. He was aware of what they said. And Aisha, she heard what they said, and she became mad and angry. Assalamu alaikum wa lana. And may the same be upon you. Curse be upon you. Death be upon you. And the Prophet وسلم, he said, Laysa hakadha ya bintu Siddiq. No, not like this. Slow down, relax, chill. In the rifqa, lam yakun fi shayin illa zanahu. Whenever there's gentleness, the thing is beautiful. And whenever gentleness is removed from a thing, it's automatically marred and it's ugly, period. Listen to these words, brothers and sisters. Whenever there is gentleness, the thing is beautiful. And whenever there is harshness and no gentleness, the thing is automatically ugly. Similarly, the Prophet ﷺ tells us, إِنَّ الْحَيَاءَ لَا يَأْتِي إِلَّا بِخَيْرٍ Whenever you're shy and modest, even we have to do what you have to do and say what you have to say and stand up and be strong and be rough and be tough, but there's still a limit of shyness that you must have. Whenever there's some shyness, there is good, the Prophet ﷺ said. And the Sahihain as well, Abu Huraira radiallahu anhu narrated, إِنَّ الْإِيمَانَ بِدْعٌ وَسِتُونَ شُعْبَةٌ Faith has over 60 levels, 60 parts, 60 degrees, 60 chambers of Iman. So the highest of those levels, the pinnacle, the summit, the apex of Iman is to make the kalima of Tawheed. La ilaha illallah. When I wake up, when I go to sleep, those are the words that I want to say on my deathbed. When the sword penetrates my midsection on the battlefield, those are the last words that I want to say. Not kiss my son for me. Tell my daughter I love her. Give money to my wife. I'll miss you guys. No. La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah. The kalim of Tawheed is the highest manifestation of Iman. وَأَدْنَاهَا إِمَاتَةٌ أَذَا عَنِ الطَّرِيقِ And the lowest level, the most basic level of faith is to remove a piece of glass from the street. To remove a piece of stone or some manure, something which is harmful from the road, from the walkway. Move it out of the way. Last but not least, brothers and sisters, the Prophet ﷺ says, and shyness is a part of faith. From those levels is to be shy and is to be bashful. Abu Mas'ud al-Badri narrates in Sahih Bukhari and others that the Prophet ﷺ said, إِنَّمَا أَوْ إِنَّ مِمَّا عَدْرَكَ النَّاسُ مِنْ كَلَامِ النَّبُوَةِ الْأُولَى from the things that have been passed down generation from generation, prophet to prophet, messenger to messenger, all of those who have some guidance and light from divine revelation, they all pass down this following statement or this idiom. When you have no shyness, you have no bashfulness, you have no modesty, you have no shame whatsoever. Then do what you want to do. them. Go ahead. If you have no shyness, then do as you please. With two interpretations. The first interpretation is a positive interpretation. In other words, if you want to do something, you're thinking about eating something or drinking something or going somewhere, you're thinking about involving yourself in some type of dealing, if you don't feel bad on the inside, if your inner voice doesn't speak against you and against the act, if you feel okay with it, you can go to sleep at night, you have no regret, it's not upon your conscience, then do it. Because it's a good thing. The strength of intuition that Allah has created within every single human being. Just like Allah created inside of different animals. The instinct of danger. The animal knows when to leave, when to run. It's dangerous. Have you ever thought about a homing pigeon? How does a homing pigeon find its way home? How amazing is that? Years before it was a global positioning satellite, a GPS. Years before there were Google Maps. Years before there was any type of navigation. Before they knew anything about longitude and latitude and degrees and nautical miles. It was the homing pigeon. A simple basic bird that many people look down upon. A rat with wings. A dirty filthy bird. The ancient Egyptians were from the first to use the homing pigeon. A basic simple cooing bird. They would take and they would throw in the air. And what do the birds do before they fly on their message? 
before they take that small piece of paper on their feet, their talons, and go to the, desti the destination that you What do they do? They fly around in the sky. They circle when you calibrate a compass. You spin the compass around, you calibrate the compass, and then you get the correct bearings. The pigeon familiarizes itself with the original location, goes to the destination, and magically returns. How does the pigeon know how to get back? How does the pigeon know where to go? Who thought of training that bird? Allah created it with the natural instinct and the ability to do so. And thus has Allah Azza created the human being with a natural calibrating system is that this act isn't right. Nah, I can't do this. I don't feel right. It doesn't feel good. It's cringy. The hair on my neck and my arms is standing up. You ever get that feeling? And every time you ignore that feeling and you turn away from it and you say, no, stop being scared, go do it, you're stifling your natural instincts more and more until you've ruined it. And every time you listen to your inner voice, you listen to your intuition, you go with the feeling that it feels good or it doesn't feel good, it becomes stronger and sharper. And you hone that natural instrument that Allah has created within your mind and in your heart and in your soul. And from that is the natural inclination towards shyness. I don't feel right. Come here, let's do this. Say this about such and such. Let's go take this person's life. Uh, I don't know. Why are you being scared? You're chicken. You're a coward. You're this word. You're that word. I don't feel right. That is the natural shyness. So the Prophet ﷺ says, if you have no shyness, then do what you want to do. In other words, if you don't have any regrets, if it doesn't feel bad, then it must mean that it is a what? It's a good, positive act to do. And the second interpretation of these words, If you have no shyness, no shame, do what you please, the Prophet ﷺ is threatening you. He's threatening you. It's fine. You don't want to be a Muslim? No problem. You don't want to pray? No problem. You want to make sins? No problem. You have no shame. You're not afraid of what people say about you, what they think about you, what you do in public, how you go outside? No problem. Because on the day of judgment, you will meet those deeds. Fasna mashita. Do whatever you wish to do. So shyness, brothers and sisters, in Al-Islam is pivotal to the believer. It is the water to the fish of the believer. Shyness and Iman go hand in hand. As the Prophet وسلم, said, Wal min al -iman. Every level of faith is connected to shyness. But there are different types of shyness, brothers and sisters. There are different levels of shyness. From that is the physical shyness. Outwardly, I can't go outside naked. I can't go outside exposing my private parts unless my fitrah has been perverted. Unless my mind has been stripped as many people today we see. They go outside, what are they wearing? Did you look in the mirror when you went outside, before you went outside? Are you aware of the fact that your body is exposed? Are you aware of the fact that your private area is in plain public vision? Do you have any shyness? Are you aware of the fact that you're dressed indecently? Are you aware of the fact that your young daughter, how can you dress her like that? She's a young child. What are you thinking? What's the matter? What is wrong? Do you have any shyness? The physical shyness, like clothing. Your clothes are wrinkled. You have cat hair all over your clothes. You're not matching. You look a hot mess. Who dressed you today? Why does your hair look like that? Have some shyness. I'm too shy to go outside looking like that for people to make fun of me and laugh at me. But that's only one manifestation of shyness. The greater shyness, the most important shyness, is the shyness in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Is what you're afraid and you're scared of Allah finding you disobeying Him. You're afraid and you're scared of meeting Allah on the day of judgment. And Allah asking you, have I not given you life? Did I not give you air to breathe, water to drink? Have I not given you a body, skin, and hair? Have I not made you handsome? How many blessings have I given you? How have you repaid me? How have you fulfilled the thankfulness of those blessings? As the Prophet ﷺ tells us about people who have no shyness. They didn't have shyness when they were alive in the dunya, and they will have no shyness on the day of judgment. The hellfire will be brought to a horrible blaze, a terrible kindling blaze. 
for three people first and foremost. Who are those three people that will go to hell first? Who are they? The fornicator, the adulterer, the murderer, the thief, he who eats from interest and usury, he who abuses the wealth of the orphans, the disrespectful child to your mother. Who will go to the hellfire first? The Prophet ﷺ said there are three people. It's the learned scholar. It is the brave warrior, the fearless mujahid. And last but not least, it is the benefactor. It is the one who spends his wealth in the day and in the night. As a wealthy man, the law is blessed with money. And he spent that money in the cause of Allah. So Allah Azzawajal will command the angels, and the angels will bring forth the first man, this poor individual. He's a scholar. He learned the Quran by heart. He memorized how many hadiths? Sahih Bukhari, Sahih Muslim. He's a great scholar. And Allah Azzawajal will speak to this man on the day of judgment. He will say, Have I not taught you? Have I not educated you? And the man, Allah Azzawajal will say, Fama amil tafiha. What did you do to repay me? How did you th show thankfulness for you being a scholar of Islam? The man would say, Ta'alamtu fiqh al-Qur'an wa qara'tuhu. I learned the book of Allah. I learned your book for your sake, oh Allah. I taught it to people. And the man, of course, on his day has what, brothers and sisters? He has no shyness. He lies to Allah in front of Allah on the day of judgment. It's not the worldly life. Maybe the hellfire isn't real. Maybe your maqiyam is just a big hoax, a, a fear tactic. He has seen the fire. He's standing in front of Allah and he has no shyness. Allah Azza wa will say to him, Kithabta, you're a liar. A horrible liar, a terrible liar. إِنَّمَا قَرَتَ الْقُرْآنَ لِيُقَالَ قَارِئٌ وَقَدْ قِيلَ The only reason why you studied the book of Allah was for the people to praise you and to laud you and to pat you on the back. And that's what you did and that, will, and that was what was done. And the same will be applied to the warrior. Not only who fought in the lost cause, but he was martyred. He was killed on a battlefield. He lost his nafs. As the Prophet ﷺ tells us, there isn't a time in which righteous deeds are more beloved to Allah than the first ten of Dhul Hijjah. Except for a man, إِلَّا رَجُلٌ خَرَجَ فِي سِبِيلِ اللَّهِ بِمَالِهِ وَنَفْسِهِ أَوْ كَمَا قَالَ فَلَمْ يَرْجِعْ مِنْ ذَلِكَ بِشَيْءٍ He went out in the cause of Allah and he returned with nothing. He died on the battlefield. That's the greatest, the greatest thing to do in Islam. It's to die in the cause of Allah. And Allah will ask this warrior, what have you done? I made you brave, I gave you strength, I gave you skill as a warrior. Uh, I gave you the honor of fighting in my cause and dying in my cause. How have you thanked me? The man would say, قَاتَلْتُ فِيكَ حَتَّى اسْتُشْهِدْتُ Oh Allah, I fought for your sake until my blood was spilt. And Allah would say to him, كَذَبْتَ You're lying to me. You're not telling the truth. وَإِنَّمَا قَالْتَلْتَ لِيُقَالَ You only fought for the people to say you're brave. And that is what the people did. And Allah will command the angels. And they will pull this man. And they will drag this man upon his face in the fire of hell. This is the fruit of not being shy in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Yastakhfuna min nasi That the munafiqun. They are shy in front of the people. But they're not shy in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Wa la yastakhfuna min Allah. And Allah is with them. If you bayituna al-ayah. Allah sees everything you do. Here's everything you do. Allah is with you when no one else is with you. So the greatest type of shyness is to be afraid in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. From the beneficial manifestations of shyness, brothers and sisters, is giving in Allah's cause, being charitable. Someone asks you for money. Times are tight. It's COVID. I'm unemployed. I'm not working. I get a check from the government on a month. I'm not getting my full salary. But someone says, Akhi, I need to borrow some money. Can you help me out? Can you give me some sadaqah? Can you, you know, you know, tight, no problem. Instead of you saying, no, I can't help you. No, the times are too tight. Because why? Why did I give him money? Because I'm what? I'm shy. I'm ashamed and I'm embarrassed of a Muslim coming to me, asking me for something and me telling him no. And this is very similar to a narration, which is famous. And the narration is narrated from some of the companions. Yes. And some of them attributed to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam That Allah Azza wa Jal إِنَّ اللَّهَ حَيِّيٌّ كَرِيمٌ سِتِّرٌ يَسْتَحْيِ مِنْ عَبْدِهِ إِذَا رَفَعَ إِلَيْهِ يَدَيْهِ أَنْ يُرُدَّهُمَا إِلَيْهِ سِفْرًا وفي رواية أن يرد إليهما خائبتين That Allah Azza wa Jal is shy, very shy حَيِّيٌّ كَرِيمٌ Allah is bountiful. He's generous. 
Allah is very giving. Last but not least, sitirun. And Allah loves to hide the faults of His servants. Allah loves to make excuses for His servants. Allah loves to give His servants a second, third, fourth chance. And from Allah's shyness, in a way that suits His majesty, is that when His servant raises his hands towards the sky, Oh Allah, give me, help me, forgive me. Allah is too shy to allow His hands to go back with nothing. In other words, the dua, inshallah, will be answered. Think about this hadith now. Think about this narration. Allah, the owner of the heavens and the earth, the creator of the heavens and the earth, he who is most powerful, almighty, hayyun, kareemun, sitirun. Allah is shy. And Allah is giving. And Allah loves to conceal the faults of his servants. When his servant raises his hands towards Allah, sincerely, genuinely, Allah is too shy for him to leave with nothing. You can't lose by making dua. Ask Allah, beg Allah, even if you're a sinner, even if you have mistakes, even if you have regret, ask Allah, so there's no way that you're going to lose. You're going to get something out of the deal. But in the night, why is that? Because Allah Azzawajal is shy. Allah loves to give to his servants. Think about this manifestation. Think about this now. And think about how shy we are with each other. Can, can you help me out? No, I can't help you. I'm sorry. Can you give me a ride? No, I'm sorry. I'm busy. I have a question. I'm sorry. I have no time to answer your question. Can I borrow some money? No, I can't. I'm sorry. I can't help you out. We're not shy in front of each other. We have no hesitation and no regret to leave our brothers hanging. We have no regret to leave them to, to hang out to dry. I can't help you. Sorry, Sheikh. Malish. Go ask somebody else. So we need to be shy, first and foremost, in front of Allah. And we need to be shy for ourselves. And we need to be shy in front of the creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We ask Allah, the mighty and the most high, by his beautiful names and by his perfect attributes to bless us with the attribute of shyness. We ask Allah Azzawajal to make us shy in front of him. We ask Allah Azzawajal to make us modest and bashful in our dress and our behavior. We ask Allah Azzawajal to allow all of the Muslims, men and women, to dress modestly and to have shame and bashfulness when they leave their homes. We ask Allah Azza to protect the Muslim youth, the young men from wearing tight skinny pants and tight shirts and exposing their odor when they go outside. We ask Allah Azza to protect the young Muslim sisters, the females, from not having shyness and going outside showing themselves, exposing themselves, wearing tight clothes, transparent clothes, and revealing clothes because of a lack of shyness. Wa subhana rabbika rabbil izzati amma yasifun wa salamu al mursaleen wa alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen.